The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he didn't exist. Let's break down one of the coolest films of the 1990s, The Usual Suspects. What is up, movie friends? Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast. And today, we're breaking down an all-time classic mystery noir, The Usual Suspects, from writer Christopher McQuarrie and director Brian Singer, who actually grew up working together. And they made their first movie together as partners. And that debuted at Sundance Film Festival, won the Grand Jury Prize. McCrory as a writer, and then Brian Singer as the director. Kevin Spacey saw that film, and that was the catalyst for The Usual Suspects. So McCrory actually got his start on this film as well. Yeah, they were creative partners and writing partners, and I, I read that Spacey, after the screening, went up to them and was like, I want to be in whatever you guys do next. And so they are trying to figure out what to do with their next movie, and they came up with an idea of this image of five guys, five criminals in a police lineup and just going from there and creating a story based off the vision of that image it basically was the jumping point for the movie and the story. As well as there's a line in Casablanca saying, round up the usual suspects. Oh, that's great. So that's yeah. where the title came from. And it was actually an image in a newspaper article of a lineup. And that's put, they put those two things together. The usual suspects started off with this idea of how did these criminals meet in uh, a lineup. Love it. Nin- they got an amazing movie out of it. Came out in 1995, written by Christopher McQuarrie, directed by Brian Singer. IMDb, The Usual Suspects, is an 8.5. Wow. 1.1 million ratings. Ain't going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. It's in the top 50 of all-time user-rated movies. It's number 46. Holy guacamole. Rotten <laughs> Tomatoes. It's an 87% critic score, a 96% audience score. Letterboxd, it's a 4.1 on a budget of just $6 million. It grossed a healthy $23 million at the global box office, but has just been probably one of the most profitable, low-budget new wars of the last 30 years when it comes to VOD sales, DVDs, VHS. Posters. Posters, merchandise, everything. That's one of the most popular posters, I feel like, in decades. And just syndication on television. Absolutely. Imagine. Plus, it won the two Oscars that it was nominated for. It was nominated for Best... Uh, adapt best screenplay with Christopher McQuarrie James winning. just had an aneurysm stroke like, incoming. I was like, uh, not, uh, I was uh, like, uh, it's uh, not uh, adapted. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's not adapted. Best screenplay for Christopher McQuarrie, Christopher McQuarrie, and that's then best supporting actor for Kevin Spacey. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't ex- exist. <laughs> says Conman Kent, drawing a comparison to the most enigmatic criminal of all time, Kaiser Soze. Kent attempts to convince the feds that the mythic crime lord not only exists, but is also responsible for drawing Kent and his four partners into a multi-million dollar heist that ended with an explosion in, in San Pedro Harbor, leaving few survivors. I gotta say, I guarantee Tom Cruise loves this movie. Probably. Because he worked with them both, writer and director for Valkyrie, and then he scooped up Chris McQuarrie for the last 15 years. Singer directed Valkyrie? Yeah, Singer directed Valkyrie. I guarantee this is one of his favorite movies because he's just... He, he basically took Chris, Chris from McQuarrie and was like, make my movies better. You're mine now. You're my guy. You're my boy. McQuarrie You're my little boy. My, my with guy. With perfect hair. <laughs> he does have Christopher hair. McQuarrie has perfect hair. He's like, uh, like David Lynch when it comes yeah, to directors yeah. with hair. He is David Lynch Great hair. Great hair. Now, this movie is really special, and it's a brilliant screenplay we all know, with wonderful performances and extremely talented ha- cast. As well, it's really well shot and e- extremely well edited by John Ottman. So this movie, the narrative... Bounces around, plays with the audience. We have an unreliable narrator. And the the movie likes to mess with the audience in a lot of ways. And John Ottman did a great job editing this film together and making it feel ominous, making it feel mysterious, stylish, while also keeping us on our toes and really just blindsiding us at, for uh, the major twist in this film. And now this film is famous for having one of the best movie twists of all time. I'm not sure when you want to spoil it, James, in this episode. Wait a little bit. Wait a, wait a little, little bit. Because who is... Kaiser Soje. That's one of the reasons why this movie is great, yeah. is the screenplay, the twist, the character, the mythos of Kaiser Soje. Not to mention this nonlinear story structure, I think, is really fascinating. It sort of deconstructs crime movies like Reservoir did, Reservoir Dogs did in 1990, where, I mean, 1992, where we're taking a crime movie, but we're seeing it from a different perspective. So the movie opens with the end and aftermath of this massive crime. And when the lead character gets shot and killed, and then everything explodes with this mysterious figure in the shadows, just kind of 
destroying the whole plans of what happened and blowing everybody up. And, and Keaton knows him. Yeah, and he they recognizes, know, him. recognizes him. So then him. the whole movie's like, who the fuck is it? It's amazing. It's a, it's a great opening because it's the aftermath. We know what's going to happen, but we have to find out throughout the rest of the story how we got there as well as who is this shadowed figure? Who is Kaiser Soze? Are they the same person? And is it a member of the crew or is it someone outside? Is it someone connected to the character Kobayashi that we haven't seen yet? So... One of the great strengths of this movie is the mystery. It's shrouded in all the suspense and thriller aspects, plus who the character of Kaiser Soze is, which one of them is it, if it is even one of the main guys. And the cast is really phenomenal, and they work and play off each other so well. We have Kevin Spacey, obviously, as Verbal, Gabriel Byrne as Dean Keaton, Chaz Palminteri as Agent David Kujan. Kujan. Uh, Kujan, sorry. <laughs> Stephen Baldwin as McManus, who is fantastic. It's his best work in his entire career. Better than Biodome. Better than Biodome? Better than wow, Biodome. high praise. Benicio Del Toro as Fenster, Who, who's great. Awesome. Awesome in this. Kevin Pollock as uh, in Hockney. And then Pete Paul has a supporting role, Susie Armas. But uh, Giancarlo Esposito as one of the FBI agents, Jack Beer. He's in a ton of this movie. Yeah, it's, he's all over it. John Carlos and it's all over the place. His accent is great in this movie. It's like it's such a, like a classic Fed accent, yeah. too. And that lineup, the image, it's, I think it's one of the most uh, memorable recognizable and iconic images in film history is that lineup with those five guys. And it's just a phenomenal cast of characters. They're all so different. They're all so unique. Uh, they have wonderful uh, dialogue. And uh, I, I just really love all these performances. And, and ultimately, as cool as the story is, it's really when they're all in scenes together is really when this movie truly shines. And Kevin Spacey, like we said earlier, got involved before this screenplay was even written, wanting to work with both the writer and director as soon as they had the next project in mind. Um, Gabriel Byrne, uh, Spacey met at a party and asked him to do this film. After reading the screenplay, he initially turned it down, thinking the filmmakers wouldn't be able to pull the script off. He then met with Chris McQuarrie and Brian Singer and was impressed by their vision of the film, eventually signing on for it as well. Uh, Paul Monteri, his character, um, Dave Kuyan, the studio and financiers wanted some big stars. Al Pacino almost took the role. He actually declined the role. He did read for it and auditioned for it. He, he would have been great, yeah. Yeah, he declined the role because he had just done Heat. He didn't want to play cops back to back, and he then regret later regretted this decision. Uh, Christopher Walken was in talks, De Niro was in talks, but they all turned it down. Um, eventually, it fell into Chas Palminteri's lap, and that was actually the biggest step forward for getting the financing fully funded. Once they got a big star, because he was huge, he had just just done a Bronx Tale, he was a very big star, and so that lay, that really let them make the film for that year. I don't blame. The actor who plays Keaton, um, Gabriel Byrne, Gabriel Byrne, for having doubts that they could pull the script off because they had just done that one movie, right? And this is a complex script. It's yeah. a lot of dialogue, a lot of talking, and some really cool action set pieces and also nonlinear storytelling. So I guess from an outside perspective, if you don't know them personally, you know how talented they were as filmmakers and writers, that does seem like a hard movie to pull off. It is quite the task to have... Five characters that are in this crime thing, but also we have other agents, other characters, lots of connective tissue, a ton of dialogue, a ton of juicy dialogue, too. And I can only imagine how much got left on the cutting room floor, too. But it seems like a hard movie to pull off, so I don't blame him for being skeptical at first. The way they convinced Gabriel Byrne, the way they got him is they said, okay, we'll shoot it in L.A. where you live, and we'll shoot it in five weeks. And then he agreed. <laughs> so there's a quick, five weeks. quick shoot in your city. And that's, that convinced them to sign on because he was very big in the 90s, uh, in, in the 80s. And next up, Stephen Baldwin as Matt McManus, Michael McManus. He's so funny in this film. He's so eccentric. He got, he's got so much uh, in, energy. He's sort of a wild card. Yeah, I, I really love him in this role. And he and Singer apparently meshed right away uh, in their first meeting. On, and he actually had wanted to be pushed by a filmmaker. And this filmmaker did do that for him. Uh, Benicio Del Toro, they actually wanted him for McManus. The role Stephen Baldwin ended up playing, but then uh, the, the character of Fenster was written to be older. They're thinking of Harry Dean Stanton for their first choice as Fenster, much older, like criminal who's like down on his luck. And Benicio found that part actually more interesting because he had an idea, and the idea was to do the voice where you can barely understand what he's saying. And the reason why Benicio del Toro did this voice is because he realized when he read the script that uh, the character, whatever he said, didn't matter. And he was, he's only there to die. So it's okay for the audience not to not understand what he's saying. Put the fuck in the bag. Put the fuck in the bag. What the fuck? What the fuck? And he actually the didn't tell the coast. He didn't tell his co-stars 
about his voice. And so the first scene they did was after the interrogation scene, after the lineup scene in the cell room, and they had no idea what he was saying because they he he and Singer kept it a secret as a reveal to throw them off guard. And that was the main intention to be like, this character doesn't matter, so then the, uh, it doesn't matter what he says, so I'm going to make it so that you can't even understand what he's saying. But he, wor- he was very, he worked with a dialect coach to craft that, so it's a very, it's very precise. It sounds like it's like he's just making it up, but it, he did prepare heavily for that. That's awesome. I love Benicio in this movie. He's so goddamn funny in it. <laughs> so great. much style, too. What I love so much about the story in this movie is it reminds me so much, obviously, of nonlinear story structure films like Reservoir Dogs, but also Memento. Because we have this opening scene, obviously, which is the finale of the story. Well, not the complete finale, but the finale of the heist. And then the rest of the film is told from the perspective of Verbal, played by Kevin Spacey, who is being interrogated by Agent Kuyan while recounting everything that he can remember, even though he's a character who has immunity with another organization, another federal organization. I can't remember which force it's with. But he has immunity. However, he is being interrogated by Agent Kuyan, which could lead to more or another kind of uh, imprisonment or potential crime put on top of him. So he's trying to play ball with Agent Kuyan so nothing bad happens to him. Even though he has immunity, there still is something that could bad so, – something could happen to him still, and he could go to jail. So he's playing ball, and he's recounting the events of everything that happened because they're trying to find out – what happened on this boat? What caused this explosion? Why these guys were there? As well as starting the story of how they all got to that room of being the usual sp- their usual suspects. Why these guys were picked up off the streets from their homes to be put in this lineup because they're the usual suspects. They're the guys. If Let's try to pin it on them, try to get something out of them to try to sit, figure out who's involved with these crimes that are happening. The cops are, like, covering their asses by bringing them in yeah. because they couldn't figure out what happened with the previous crime, with the truck robbery. So they just brought in the usual suspects. And unbeknownst to them, they caused them to form a little group inside prison. The Avengers. The Avengers, the usual suspects, decide to make a little team and start doing heists themselves. And first off, robbing the finest taxi service, which is a taxi service illegally run by police officers in New York City, for transporting people who are carrying cash, gems, anything like that. Obviously, in the film, it's gems. But the storyline goes from verbal telling everything how they got to the point of the events that occurred on the ship that exploded, as well as the present day, which is him with Agent Kuyan, and obviously how it ends eventually. Should we spoil it now? With yeah, man. Kaiser Soze is. Well, actually, before we spoil who Kaiser Soze is, let's talk about the myth. <laughs> <laughs> of Kaiser Soze. Kaiser yeah, Soze set him up. Is, is so fascinating. So these criminals, they all kind of know each other. We discover in the lineup, they kind of like know of each other's names or if they've worked together in the past. Yeah. They Keaton, have reputations. Keaton's very famous. Yeah, in they the have underworld. reputations. Yeah. Keaton's a character. He's one of the biggest criminals in the city. However, he's gone clean. He's he's dating a lawyer and he's trying to clean up his act right now. He's trying to become a businessman. But also some of them share time with one another. So Verbal had shared some time with Keaton. That's how Keaton knew who he was. So uh, the underworld community, it's like a little bubble of criminals and people talk. So that's how they know who each other are. And Kaiser Soze is a name that keeps cropping up eventually later on in the film. And we find out Kaiser Soze is this ruthless crime lord with a mythic reputation in the criminal underworld using his skills as a con artist. And criminal mastermind Soze outsmarts every single policeman throughout the film, including Detective David Dave Kulian, and succeeds in his plan to kill the one man who could identify him to the authorities. So we can assume at this point in the story that the shadowed figure at the opening of the movie is probably Kaiser Soze, if this is the first time you've seen it. But what's so fascinating about him is all these rumors. We, no one knows if they're real or made up. No one knows what he looks like. And also this great these great stories of one of the flashbacks when... I love when his name starts getting cropped up about 30 minutes into the movie and Dave, and Kuyan hears the name and he walks in because the Hungarian uh, guy, the criminal, Hungarian yeah. criminal in the hospital brings up Kaiser Soze. Kaiser Soze! Soze. And he wa- Kuyan walks into the, the office where Verbal is. He's like, who's Kaiser Soze? And Verbal's like, God damn it! God damn it! He's like, oh man, I don't want to tell you about Kaiser Soze. And he starts going to the story of this mythos of this massive, larger-than-life criminal in the underworld and this backstory of how ruthless he is where Hungarian rivals went and attacked his wife and kids. And what does Kaiser Soze do? He kills his own wife and kids to just prove a point of how ruthless he absolutely is. Let's a Hungarian go. And then he murders the entire families and communities of that Hungarian and anyone who wronged him. 
and becomes a myth. Who knows if any of this is true? Probably not, because we eventually find out who is Kaiser Soze. First, before we get into who oh, he is, we're still gonna. He, th- he's actually the reason why they're all there. Yeah, they all wronged him in the past from his huge criminal em- empire. Nobody knows really how big it is, but he has his hands in pretty much every industry imaginable, and each one of these men have wronged his business empire in a certain way, whether it be robbing someone, uh, robbing a truck, or or uh, soliciting someone, or what have you. They all have taken from Kaiser Soze, and so he's brought them all together and knows everything about their lives and their entire criminal history, and is basically forcing them to work together, or else they're fucking dead. Yeah, Kobayashi, who's basically a representative of Kaiser Soze, he reveals this all to them. Each one going one by one, how they've wronged Kaiser Soze, how they didn't realize they were connected to Kaiser Soze or had done jobs for Kaiser Soze or stole from him. And Kaiser Soze obviously got them all together on purpose to pull a heist for them, for him, by forcing them to do it because he now know he, he reveals that he has all the details of everything they've ever done, every detail of their life. I love when they all get the folders from Kobayashi one by one. So they actually, when they get the folders, the way it's placed out person to person is the order in which they die no way in the film that's how it's the exact same order that's so freaking yeah. cool yeah so it go it actually so the first person to get the folder is um it's paul it's pollock's character is, uh hockney and then it's fenster oh no so it's fenster hockney and then keaton uh, mcmanus and keaton so the order in which they receive their folders, folders is the order in which they die in the film. I really like that. That's sort of when I was watching Alien the other day when um, uh, John Hurt's character, he's the first one to wake up yeah. in the pods. Yeah, yeah. And then he's also the first one to die. Yeah. Uh, it was his, his character name's Kane, I think. You just um, saw it. I can't remember. Yeah, I think it's Kane. And that's an awesome fact. I had no idea yeah. about that. That's really fascinating. But I, I feel like we should just... Let's do it, man. Spoil who Kaiser Soze is right now. Because Spoil sure, alert if you have not seen The Usual Suspects. I'm sure everyone knows. I mean, we're 18 minutes-ish into this episode, so I think it's okay to finally talk about who Kaiser Soze is. Now, so first, can... what makes the twist so great <laughs> is it's not just a twist. It's a double twist! It's a double, double. It's a it's... double twist. I love it. You don't see it coming. You don't, Your head's spinning. First, we get the first twist. It was Keaton. Kaiser Soze was Keaton. We get all the backstory from verbal he's the he's obviously the guy he set this all up he's the mastermind it couldn't be verbal he's so weak and he's, frail he's play keaton's been playing us all keaton was kaiser soze or was he james he or was he because it actually is verbal the whole time verbal kent is kaiser soze and it's got to be one of the best revelations i've ever seen in a movie of a massive twist because like you said it's a double twist they tricked the audience and what the script does so well is it really takes advantage of the gullibilities of the audience members when they're listening and watching and, and enjoying this film because we really we're looking for an answer that is almost impossible to find. Obviously, you can predict it, but everything that the storytellers do with this movie points us in the exact opposite directions and gives us there's no chance that it could have been verbal. I mean, who even considers the fact that he's putting on this entire act, this physicality of cerebral palsy? To seem so weak, to seem so frail, to seem so dumb, but it's so genius because no one would ever suspect him. It's his. Uh, it's the way he's invisible to the criminals, invisible to police, to be just undermined and like an afterthought, an afterbirth when it comes to who could be committing crimes and who is the behind these plans. Even though he does have plans, as they're starting to be a team here, the man with the plan. That's what they could start calling him. But it's the perfect cover. It really is. No one suspects him. Because he's so brilliant, he's so sharp, he's so clever, he's 10 steps ahead of everybody this entire movie, whether it's the other criminals, whether it's Kuyan, or whether it's any rival, he's ahead of them all. And what's interesting is the way they threw the audience off the scent really well is a different person played the character of Kaiser Soze in every moment that you saw him, whether especially with the, the trench coat and hat, so different actors played him. And also the filmmakers played him. So at one point, uh, the editor, John Ottman, used his hands in place for Kaiser Soze's hands in an insert shot. Brian Singer used his feet in, in, in an insert shot of Kaiser Soze. We got multiple versions of him played by different actors and people on set on the boat. So uh, we could never really get a clear image of Kaiser. And then if you did think you saw him, the next time you saw him, he would look different. So they constantly threw you off the scent by misleading the audience with his physicality. But it makes sense. 
it's not quite a ripoff because it's we're being told a story by an unreliable narrator. So it's okay to be an unreliable storyteller sometimes. And also, we also don't even know if Kaiser Soze even exists. Yeah. He could just be a myth. There could be someone else just pulling the strings who's Kaiser Soze, or if he even exists, but it ends up being verbal, which is such a great reveal because the whole time he's talking to us, he's talking to the audience, he's giving us all this information, all this exposition of what happened. Also, he's the first character shown after the opening explosion. Yeah. He's the first character. He's an interrogation underneath that big white light with the the what's the effect they do to film to the nitrate the silver bypass the silver bypass and he's glowing in the light it's one of my yeah. favorite parts of the movie is that silver bypass he's under this white light glowing that's that's Kaiser Soze within six minutes of the movie we see his face right away because we're so curious who the shadow figure is and I love the filmmaking in, in, in lighting in the opening scene where we only see the shadows of him we don't see who he actually is and I think it's just so funny the way he pisses on the fire trail because Keaton's going to blow up the ship with Kaiser Soze on it. And then the revelation when Keaton sees Kaiser Soze, it's great because we clearly, like you said, he knows who he is. He can't believe it. He's laughing to himself. He's like, oh, my God, it's you this whole time. Yeah, it's fantastic. And the reveal is amazing. And what I love so much about this film is not just the editing, but the cinematography. We get a lot of great split diopter shots. We got a lot of great tight push-ins, uh, two shots. You'll have verbal tight close-up in focus with Kuyan behind him in the fore- in the background, glaring right at him. They made great use of the camera work in this film and also just kind of playing with the tone of uh, boxing the characters in to make them, the audience feel just as confused and anxiety-ridden as like the investigators are. So, like, there's great shots of Chaz Palminteri and the other, the other officer there. And they're sitting pretty far away from each other in the room. Palminteri's sitting on the table, and then the other guy's sitting behind him on the table. And they frame them. They do this a lot. They frame them really tight and awkwardly because they don't know what the fuck's going on. And so they did a great job reflecting uh, the, the tone of the characters in the cinematography of this movie. And Spacey's so good as Kaiser, as Verbal, Kent... He's in this interrogation room with Kuyan the whole time, and everything he's feeding, not just Kuyan, but also the audience, is made up, pretty much. A lot of it's true, but a, a lot of the details, the the names, even the name Kobayashi, that is the bottom of a mug. A, a porcelain company made that. It wasn't a real person, really. Although we do see that character later on. He's the one who gets picked up, who picks him up in he the car. He just never uses the right names. But he, he never does. He just he, he sees the details all over this wall, these random things. of It's not even Kuyan's office. It's Kuyan's friend's office another colleague at the department he's looking at all these random photos uh, uh even silly like things like saying when i used to pick beans in guatemala like <laughs> coffee beans like you you pick coffee beans in guatemala <laughs> cool, he doesn't even think to question they that. pass it off they're just like they interrupt him because he's so good because they don't suspect him at all it's great conversation it's casual things barely even considering him to be a big fish in this crime underworld in this crime syndicate and this crime in general and he just picks off all these little details. And when Kuyan, when it finally hits him, after he lets a verbal go, at the same time, what's happening? The Hungarian has woken up. He's giving details for a police sketch artist to draw a picture of who Kaiser Soze is because he saw him alive. And who's it end up being? Before Kuyan even sees it, we get the reveal from someone else that it's a sketch of what Kevin Spacey looks like, what Kint looks like, what Verbal looks like. And dropping that glass, dropping the mug is one of the most uh, memorable moments of this entire film. And then Kaiser walking away with his cerebral palsy, the shot of his feet, which go- which reveals his limping gait, which turns into a normal walk, revealing that it was all an act. He gets into a car after smoking a cigarette. It's great. The sketch of Kaiser Soze in this film is not far off from the sketch of John Doe in Seven. Is it really? Yeah, it's pretty close. It's pretty similar. And Mills is like, yep, yep, oh, yep, yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. It's pretty similar it's pretty good. Yeah, how right. crude it is. And I feel like uh, on, on a rewatch, I feel like there was a moment where Spacey was in it. It was when Spacey, when Verbal's alone, the first shot of Verbal in, Ku, in Kuyan's friend's office, when they're talking about him, they're like, please tell me you have that cripple. I got to talk to him. I got to talk to him. And then it cuts to Verbal sitting alone in the room. And this is right before he starts looking at uh, around the room and we don't even really understand why he's looking around until at the end of the film obviously he's gathering information to use but i feel like there's this 
this moment, it's like two seconds of, of Spacey just sitting there with like a dead look on his face. And I feel like that was Kaiser. And then he then he put on the charade once they walked in, obviously. But I feel like they he did a really subtle character character change in the in the moment when they entered the room. This is you're right. This is a really enjoyable rewatch of a movie. Multiple rewatches, but even if you haven't seen it in a while, just to see how Spacey's doing the performance as verbal, even though he's Kaiser Soze the whole time. For these little details like that, that I think you're exactly right. Even you can kind of see it in his eyes when they're pulling heists, when he's got the sunglasses on. He just, you just know it's him. You know it's an act. But even on rewatches, you're convinced that verbal really is verbal. He's not really Kaiser Soze because the performance is really that goddamn good. And it's, it's really, honestly, it's more than anything. It's the physicality, uh, the total commitment. He goes full Daniel Day with the cerebral palsy. Uh, Kaiser Soze, gotta give, give it up to him. And on top of that, so in the flashbacks of Kaiser Soze, it's revealed that he's left-handed. He always fires his gun with his left hand, and even in the opening when he turns, he, he when he shoots Keaton, he shoots him with his left hand. But with verbal, his left hand is the strict, the one stricken with cerebral palsy, and his right hand is the one he uses. So that's another thing that complete. He, he's so smart; he throws people off the scent by he's a lefty in real life, but then as verbal, he's he pretends to be right-handed, You're and right. that throws that's the audience awesome. off too. So his cerebral palsy, they were in his research for people who suffered from the uh, the ailment. Um, he was trying to figure out how to do it, so he, he decided to do just the left side of his body as being su- suffering from the ailment. So his left leg, and then his left hand, his left arm. But in reality, in reality, uh, Kaiser Soze is left-handed. That's wicked smart because when he's with Kuyan, he picks up the gun. He's like, "How do you shoot the devil? What if you miss?" And he can't even hold the gun straight. And also, he can't even light his, the cigarette lighter because he's not right-handed. Mm-hmm. So it's really smart because it makes him look even even uh, more uh, incapable of anything because he's using his bad hand to do everything. Yeah, that's really clever. Yeah, super clever. I had no idea about that at all. Well, I want to talk some more about the usual suspects, but first, I want to head to our intermission. If that's cool with you, let's do it. But before we continue, the best way to support Raiders of the Lost Podcast is to become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Why would you want to do this? Because you get awesome perks like access to the ad-free version of every single episode, as well as bonus episodes we post every week. Not to mention you get access to our Discord, free merchandise, private videos, watch party access. It's a lot of fun being a patron of our show. Not only that, you get to support us, and it's the only way we can do the show full-time. So without Patreon... Raiders of the Lost podcast probably wouldn't exist, and Anthony would be face down in the bottom of a drain pool, dead. Killed by Kaiser Soze. Killed by Kaiser Soze. Another great way to support the show is to leave those five-star ratings and reviews on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Why would you want to do that as well? Because they help us get seen by new people. It's what helps our show chart. It's what helps viewers find us when they're browsing selections of movie podcasts and they get suggested this dope-ass podcast. It's because we have lots of ratings and great written reviews, which we love to read out on the show. On Apple Podcasts, you can leave written ones. I'll get to one in just a minute, and at 5,000 ratings, I will be getting a tattoo of Anthony's Choice, so... It'll be Kaiser Soze, the sketch. Hopefully it's something cool. And the final best way to support our show is to become a... I mean, I already said that. Yeah. To share us with your family and friends. Share the load! Word of mouth is the best way for a podcast to grow organically, so just share us with your family, your friends... Your movie peeps, let them know about Raiders of the Lost podcast. This episode, like always, is sponsored by our friends at MoviePosters.com, the number one place to get your posters online today. Be sure to use our promo code Raiders10 at MoviePosters.com to get 10% off your order right now. They have a huge selection of pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable in their poster library. If you love movies from the 90s like The Usual Suspects, they have everything, all of those amazing crime films they got in their library all sorts of sizes and framing. They got backlighting for your poster needs, whatever you want, high-quality prints. We have these all over our set and all over our home. Movieposters.com is the best place to get your posters. Get them for yourself, deck out your place, or get them for the movie lover in your life as a gift. And be sure to use our promo code Raiders10 at Movieposters.com to get 10% off your order right now. All right, let's begin with our movie quotes competition. Are you ready? Ready. I don't care about the money. I'm pulling back the curtain. I want to meet the wizard. Huh. Say it again. I don't care about the money. I'm pulling back the curtain. I want to meet the wizard. I don't know. The game. Oh, nice. Nice. All right, here's mine. 
It is not our abilities that show what we truly are. It is our choices. Hmm. One more time. It is not our abilities that show what we truly are. It is our choices. X-Men? No. Sounds like Charles Xavier. Um, <laughs> I don't know. That's Dumbledore in Chamber of Secrets. Oh, wow. What a it's what an L. Our, not our abilities. No, yeah, it is a very Dumbledore thing to show what we are. It is our choices. All right, Big yeah. L, James. Big L. Your favorite one. Guess this movie release here, Anthony. Rock and Rolla. 2009. 2008 would be the correct <sighs> answer. Motherfucker. What year did Unforgiven come out? That would be 1990. No. Damn it. <laughs> 92? Yes. Yeah. Nice try. Mm. All right. Pop quiz time. How many movies... Are Bruce Willis and Sam Jackson in together? Hmm. And can you name them? So I'm going to go with, obviously, Pulp Fiction. One. And then The Full Monty. The Full Monty? No. I don't think that's one of them. The Whole Nine Yards. Nope. Um, shit. Uh, Die Hard with a Vengeance. Two. Um, what else? Did they do together? I'm going to go with three movies together. There's four. Ah, you got two of them. What are the other two? Unbreakable. Oh, my God. <laughs> and then. God damn. They're both in a spoof movie in 1993. Sam was one of the leads called Loaded Weapon 1. Loaded Weapon 1. Spoof of Lethal Weapon. I can imagine. And that's four. Wow. There are four movies I together. wouldn't have gotten that, so no ways. But I should have gotten Unbreakable. Should have gotten Unbreakable. I'm surprised. I thought that'd be the at least first or second one he said. You know what? I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Glass. All right. Richard Harris co-starred in what? Alexandre Dumas adaptation. Um... The Three Musketeers. Incorrect. (sighs) It was The Count of Monte Cristo. Ah. God damn it. Nice try. You were wrong. I tried. All right, Anthony. Do you have any unsubscribes this week? Oh, yeah. Well, we did record today, and we have... Let me see if we received any since today. (laughs) Uh, We have not. So no unsubscribes today. All right. Well, how about um, I read a review... That was written by Zachary Z. Let's hear it, Zach. Five stars. Best podcast out there. I've listened to every episode, and honestly, I can't say enough. Good things about it. Fantastic movie podcast. 10 out of 10. Would recommend. Thanks, pal. Appreciate that. Zachary. Every episode. Wow. Thank you so much. What about a streaming recommendation, Anthony? What do you got? Last night, I watched Saturday Night Fever on Amazon Prime. Nice. It was fucking awesome. Hell yeah. It is fantastic. Highly recommend. Cool. I am recommending Mr. and Mrs. Smith, the original version of the movie, which is on Netflix now, streaming. Oh, interesting. So give that a watch because it is a banger of a movie. I also want to watch, I think I want to watch Ripley on Netflix just to see it. The series? Yeah. I'm afraid I I to. watch it. Why are you to. afraid to? I don't know. Don't be afraid, man. Let it happen. Let it happen. <laughs> just let it, <laughs> let it happen. I guess so. All right, let's get back into the usual suspects. I want to do uh, some superlatives if you are down for it. Oh, yeah, let's do some. Cool. Now, let me know. What is your favorite shot in this movie, The Usual Suspects? Oh, that's a tough question. I can question. go first if you want. Yeah, go first. I'll, I'll give it some thought. My favorite shot, and it's really jaw-dropping, is after the, ta- the, t- the tables are turned by uh, Kobayashi and he learn and the crew learns that threatening him was a mistake because he can they can get at their loved ones, each of their loved ones. He names all their loved ones, and then they finally see Anita is the lawyer. Yeah. Um, she's in a meeting in the office. And then Kobayashi goes inside and sits down next to her and he's like, Yeah, man. And but the way that it reveals the crew is they're standing behind a glass wall, and we're only seeing the blue reflection of the skyscrapers behind us. And then uh, one of the men in the room walks 
behind camera, blocking some of the sunlight, revealing Gabriel Byrne and the rest of the crew in his silhouette, in his shadow on the glass. I think it's just such a jo- it's incredible, beautiful, simple, but so cool and effective. I'm just gonna go with the lineup photo, the li- the lineup shot, just the straight on one's terrific, but then also. In the foreground shot, there's a side shot, and the foreground is verbal, and he's in focus. Everyone else is out of focus. I think that's a great one, too. Yeah. But yeah, I'll probably go with the, the lineup. Nice, dude. You know, that that kind of makes me wonder. I, when I, whenever I watch this movie, obviously Kobayashi, the guy who plays Kobayashi, even if that's not his real name, it's made up by verbal in, the, in Kuya's friend's office. Do you think that that guy knew that verbal was – Kaiser Soze, or was it always a mystery to him until later on in the story? Obviously, he revealed it to him at some point. Do you think he was in on it the whole time and so had to act like he didn't know who Verbal was in terms of being Kaiser Soze, or do you think he's always been in on knowing that Verbal was Kaiser Soze? I think he always knew, Mm -hmm. and then he was just acting just just like Kaiser was acting. So I think that the little lawyer, Kobayashi, was always acting too. Damn good. Damn good actors. That's how you throw the off, yeah. Throw the audience off. No, yeah. yeah, no, yeah. I just, I just always wonder about that between those two characters. If, if the character of Kobayashi always knew that it was verbal. What is his accent exactly? When I watch it this sounds, because it could, because Pete Postlewaite is Irish, and you do hear a hint of his Irish accent in it still. Yeah, but it also sounds almost Indian to an extent. Yeah, I think I feel like it's Indian. Kobayashi accent, the usual suspects, because it feels Indian, but. Uh, it's it just, I don't know. It, okay, in spite of being a Japanese name, his nationality is British, and he speaks with a British Indian accent. British Indian, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at first, Special Agent Kuyan realized that Vesper's story was fabricated, blah, 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 blah. Okay, yeah. So, British Indian. All right, what is, who is your favorite character? Um, It's tough. It's a tough choice. I would say... I'll probably go uh, Kaiser Soze verbal. You know, I, I really like Benicio as Fenster, but I feel like he's just not in it long enough to really enjoy. Plus, he dies so soon. And like you said, Benicio's kind of messing with the story in terms of like the character it doesn't really serve much of a purpose. So let me just make him ridiculous and you can't really understand what he's saying for mm-hmm. fun. So I'll probably go Kaiser Soze. Yeah, I'm going to go with uh, verbal Kaiser Soze as well. Um, it's just he carries the film. Uh, next up, who is the MVP of the film? MVP of the film. That's a really good question. Oh, I'm gonna go Christopher McQuarrie. It's it's just written so well. It's filmed brilliantly as well. But I think just the story, the screenplay, the dialogue. That's it, man. That's what does it. That's the stuff, yeah. man. I'm going with Kevin Spacey actually for the MVP, uh, because as well directed and written it as it is, an Oscar winning screenplay. Like I just said, he carries the film, and he is telling the story to the audience, and it's his controlled, calculated uh, performance. Uh, he is so much command on the screen. Uh, Kevin Spacey just absolutely floored everybody with this performance, and it really, if it wasn't as strong as an actor, it wouldn't have worked as well. So I think his performance really was the biggest thing that had to work to make this movie great. Next up, what is your favorite line from the film? Ah, oh, that's pretty easy. It's... The greatest trick the devil devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he didn't exist. It's such a great line. It's iconic. It's also in another movie that Gabriel is in. Gabriel Byrne? Gabriel Byrne's in with Arnold Schwarzenegger, End of Days. <laughs> it's also said in that movie, which also came out in the 90s, End I believe. End of Days. Uh, actually, I, my favorite quote, because it makes me laugh every time. Back when I was picking beans in Guatemala, <laughs> we used to make fresh coffee right there off the trees, I mean. That was good. This is shit, but hey, I'm in a police station. It's a good line. <laughs> it's so it's a funny movie. It's a funny it's movie. Like revisiting yeah. it, I, I laugh like ten times easily. All right, what is your best scene slash moment in the film? Oh, the best scene. It's when Koyun drops the mug. That it's the best scene. The revelation the of everything. The montage. It's brilliant. Yeah. My favorite moment is the the walk. Yeah. So the, the walk change. Not even the montage, but just that moment when yeah. it's revealed that he, him walking. It's done so well. This yeah. character spoofed so brilliantly in scary movie. <laughs> <laughs> with Officer Doofy. It's so damn good. It's such a great ending. And he even has like a hot babe picking him up and they make out in the car and then they drive off. Yeah, even though it's Kobayashi in the movie. But it's so clever the way they do it in Scary Movie and hysterical. And I loved 
how it happened, and I didn't really see it. I remember the first time. She finds his clothes. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's ridiculous, man. Um, uh, It's great. Officer Doofy reporting for duty, sir. (laughs) He said, never disturb me when I'm cleaning my room. (laughs) So goddamn funny. (laughs) Oh, my God. I fucking love it. (laughs) All right. What else you got? Oh, so much, man. No, for any more superlatives? No, that's it for superlatives, yeah. Well, when we talk about Keaton, it's it's so good for the audience because we think at first Keaton's dead, but we don't technically see him die. We don't technically see his body. There's a burnt corpse. Could be Keaton, but no one knows. And we don't see him die, so when we get that first revelation from Verbal that it was Keaton all along, he's been pulling the strings this entire time. I was protecting him. And, Ke- and K- uh, Kuyun... Is try he thinks it's Keaton. He's convinced it's Keaton. He's been trying to nail Keaton for crimes for years now. Mm-hmm. It's been his golden goose. I gotta get this guy finally. And he's like, I'm not I'm not buying this act that he's cleaned up. But the fact that we don't see Keaton die, the fact that Kuyun wants it to be Keaton so bad, and verbal under what feels like to him or to Kuyun feels like pressure to reveal the truth. Like, just tell me the goddamn truth. Let's get it out of you. The audience, I think, accepts it that it is Keaton this entire time, and that's because it's a good twist. It's a great twist. That is that would be a good twist because, like I said, we don't see his body. We we see a burnt corpse, which obviously is his body. We find out later on, but we don't know that it's Keaton because we don't see him actually die. We we cut from. Oh, I gotta change my best shot. We cut when the shadow figure pulls the the trigger and kills or shoots Keaton. We don't see it happen. We just hear the gunshots. My my all right. My favorite shot is. During the boat raid, which is an awesome sequence. Great action. We have explosives. We have awesome gunshots and squib work. It's really terrific. But during the boat heist, um, there's a shot of inside of outside the circular window. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the flashes from the gunfire as the camera's pulling up. That's my favorite yeah, shot. Yeah, when he hits his target, yeah. yeah. But, but the boat scene in general is really terrific because we're finally seeing the heist. We saw at the beginning with the aftermath, everyone died. We find out real quickly that everyone's dead because of the reports and the And there was no coke. No, there's no coke in the boat. Yeah. And the raid is terrific. You know, the, the team, they have a great plan, and they're, they're very successful at what they do. Obviously, they're a little messy in their, in their jobs and their heists, but they get the jobs done for the most part. Obviously, they weren't expecting to steal drugs earlier, which is why they're pissed off when they go through with the other, the, the other crime guy. Um, but the boat sequence of attacking the boat is terrific because— each one of them are getting taken out. We don't know who's taking them out. And then the With ending's the POV. Re- yeah, and the yeah. ending's really clever because Verbal's going to and from places, but he's not near, we we don't think, the murder of each of these guys because he's shown somewhere else. But that's the that's the thing of being an unreliable narrator. He's not he's telling us what happened, but he's just lying about where he was at specific moments. The, in the with the edit, they do give a hint. So before it goes to the long POV of Kaiser Soze moving through the boat. The last person we see on screen is verbal. Mm-hmm. So they do give a couple of hints as well as... Like in the van, right? With the van? The back of the van? I'm not sure about the back of the van, but um, there's another one where... So the film, during the opening, Keaton's killed, and then it, there's that really great slow push in on the ropes and crates. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's someone hiding in it's there. A, they're implying that someone must be hiding watching. In reality, there was never anyone there. Mm-hmm. There's never anybody there. But what happened was... Verbal was told to hide behind that to for safety. And then they so Singer and the team brilliantly choreographed it and blocked it where so we watch him and so the way that's set up the construction of it is there's the ropes and crates and then uh to the right of it is metal barrels. And so uh, what happens is Spacey runs behind the barrels, but we never actually see his image through the woodworking and, and the ropes of those wooden crates. It's, he, he, so they instructed him to stop behind the wooden, the, me, the metal barrel. So in the audience, they're showing evidence that, that even though that they implied someone was hiding there, Verbal was never there. He never went there. This is good filmmaking. We're yeah. insinuating that someone's behind those crates. Even the opening scene where they push, oh, there must be someone behind those crates. Yeah. Never there the whole time. Yeah, no one was there the whole time. And what's brilliant about the whole Keaton, Keaton thing is the whole film is we're teased about Keaton's past. About how ruthless and murderous and, and and legendary he is in the criminal underworld, but he's changed. He's trying not to be, but we get these hints of like he killed three people and one of the cops in his investigations, and uh, then we learn that he shipped two people in prison. And it's just like this guy, uh, he's built such a big street cred because 
in his past, he was so brutal. And so then when that first twist is revealed of it being Keaton, the audience is like, oh my God, it all makes sense now. He has that dark past. He used to do those things. So it makes sense. He definitely, he definitely is Kaiser Soze. I get that. And so that's why it works so well to frame it, suspicious, keep suspicions on the audience on Gabriel Byrne's character, Keaton. And also his performance, it seems like he's, he's struggling with something inside. It seems like he's hiding a lot from even the crew and even from the audience in his performance. So the whole team did a great job of making sure that if when that first Keaton twist is revealed, the audience accepts it completely. I really like there's a specific conversation between Keaton and Verbal about halfway through the movie where Keaton genuinely is trying to protect Verbal. I can't remember exactly what he says, but he's like, I, I want to make sure you're, you're okay and that you're going to get out of this clean. You know, pr- I want you to protect yourself. You know, I'll, I'll take responsibility for what's about to happen. And then he walks away from verbal. And you just, I just watched the performance from Kevin Spacey because for a second, he's probably like, as Kaiser Soze, he's like, wow, that was really nice of him, but I'm still going to kill him <laughs> because he does. It shows you how merciless he is and how ruthless is he is. This guy is trying to do him a favor and trying to protect him as Kent as verbal, but yeah, I'm totally going to kill you. <laughs> I appreciate it anyways, but he's like, oh, well, that was really nice. Uh, should I kill him? Yeah, I'm still going to kill him. <laughs> There's an irony to the film. I don't know if you've caught it on the, the, on the rewatch. The great irony of the usual suspects is that um, uh, they, I guess they were all eventually the usual suspects committing a crime together. No, 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 no. I mean, that's what? not ironic. That's just, that's just literal. Um, so the irony of the usual suspects is Kaiser Soze, his whole plan was to get a crew to be able to take out the people on that boat so he can kill the guy who could identify him as Kaiser Soze. And the irony is he walks out of that police station. Now that everybody knows what Kaiser Soze looks like. Yeah. That's the irony of the film. But he's got the 91 mil, right? Or he's got the he's, he's got, got the, the money gems. back, and then he'll disappear forever, like yeah. he says. And he says, Let "My guess, you'll never see him again." I think that verbal as Kaiser is telling the truth. Like after this, he's going to disappear forever. Yeah, he's got the money. To but, live. That's, but that's the irony of the film is uh, he. The whole plan is to kill this guy who can ID him as Kaiser, and then at the end of the film, all these people can ID him as Kaiser Soze. That's a good point. Yeah, but it worked because he guy, got away though. Yeah, he got away. He got away. And he didn't know that that uh, Kuyan put it all together. That's, yeah, that's the irony is that Kuyan and the police put the team together. It's a double irony on a double twist. So they're the usual suspects, and they became a team because the cops put them together. Yeah. And it's sort of like Kaiser knows them so well. He knew that once he got them all, all these criminals into a room together in a jailhouse that— of course, one of them would suggest scheming together, and one of them would come up with a plan. One of them had a job coming up. Like, hey, might as well like work together, everybody. I think it was really clever because he knows them so so well. Yeah, I, I agree. And the, the film makes great use of of colors and tones. We get a lot of contrasting blues and yellows with the cinematography and lighting that work really well. We're kind of ahead of its time. And also, there's a really cool they in that parking garage when they rob the the emerald. The guys with the em- who they thought had emeralds but ended up having heroin. Um, the team put in these fluorescent green lights. This is something that we see all the time nowadays in film cinematography, like colored bar bar lights on sets. And so this is actually like a really early precursor, kind of ahead of its time in terms of its cinematography. I think this film is really visually dynamic and so well shot. And I love there's a transition of the cave. So after Fenster is killed, and then they're they're all arguing about what to do next. And then they end up all helping bury Fenster. And the, the, the camera is positioned inside of the cavern and starts pulling back. And so the, the circle doorway of the cavern starts shrinking in the frame. And then they transition that into the coffee mug being held, uh, overhead shot of the coffee mug. That's a great edit and transition that I love in the film. Yeah, all right. And That's also insane. they make use of great pickup shots. That one of the, uh, the coolest shots that they got that was actually a pickup was when... Uh, they go after Kobayashi in the in the skyscraper, and McManus takes out the two guys standing next to Kobayashi, a security detail in the elevator. And then Kobayashi looks up, and we see the reverse of uh, McManus sitting on top of the elevator. That was actually done in the parking lot outside the studio. <laughs> That's great because they did they didn't get that for coverage, so they're like, "Oh, we need to get a shot of him." Nobody knows. Doesn't couldn't even notice. How would they know? Yeah, 
How would they know? There's a lot of great filmmaking in this movie. Yeah, and I guess Stephen Baldwin and Kevin Pollack, they did not like each other. And this is the movie that started their long-standing feud with each other. It began on the set of The Usual Suspects, though neither actor directly stated or has stated what caused their animosity towards each other. Pollock does mention that Baldwin, in an attempt to stay in character as McManus, would go around acting tough and sometimes bully the other actors. Baldwin does admit that he was bullying towards Pollock on film and had multiple confrontations and standoffs with each other on screen and off screen. Hmm. Interesting. I didn't know they had uh, such a long feud. Maybe a little bit too method over there, Baldwin. So the lineup scene is so famous and... What's so great about it is there's a camaraderie already there in the cast, and they're giggling and laughing, and that was all for real. So what happened was once the five of them were in a room, they couldn't keep it together, and they kept ruining takes, and then uh, Baldwin and Benicio kept trying to make the other actors break, and they spent 18 hours shooting that scene one day and didn't get much usable footage, and and then Singer went off on them, and they tried to do it again, and again they had the same problem of the actors just all cracking up and breaking character, and not being able to maintain a straight face. So that's why in a couple of the moments of the lineup scene, they're giggling and laughing. Those are actual real laughs of them not being able to hold it together filming that scene. And yeah. Apparently someone kept farting too. Benicio, I guess. Benicio kept yeah. farting is what I've heard. <laughs> this is a crazy fact. So in 2017, amid a flood of sexual misconduct allegations against Kevin Spacey, Gabriel Burns said that at one point during the shooting of The Usual Suspects, Production was shut down for two days because Kevin Spacey made unwanted sexual advances toward a younger actor in June 2018. Kevin Pollack claimed that the person in question was actually the then-boyfriend of director Brian Singer, whose career has also come to a halt as he had uh, allegations of sexual misconduct brought against him as well recently. Yeah, Spacey and Singer, they're both uh, done in Hollywood now. Done forever. Yeah, good for that. I mean, they should be done. McQuarrie wrote nine drafts of the screenplay also over the period of five months until they were happy with what they had to shoot. Wow. So the, the name Kaiser Soze, uh, originally, uh, Christopher McQuarrie came up with a name, and it wasn't Kaiser Soze. It was, hold, 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 please, hold, please, uh, based the name Kaiser Soze on one of his previous supervisors at an office he worked in. That guy's name was Kaiser Sume. Now he thought the guy would be offended and might even take uh, law- lawful action against him if he used his real name. And so he changed it from Kaiser Sume to Kaiser Soze because his roommate, McCord's roommate, had an English to Turkish dictionary which translated uh, Soze as talks too much. And so he found the word Soze in a Turkish dictionary, which is why he ended up making the character Turkish. So um, Roger Ebert... The, I saw that. The the famous film critic of the past gave this movie one and a half stars and two thumbs down wow. when he saw it at Sundance Film Festival all the way back in 1995. You can still see his review online, obviously, because they're all still public. But yeah, on August 18, 1995, he reviewed The Usual Suspects one and a half stars out of five. Goodness! Back then, that pulled a lot of weight, and I'm sure it affected its box office. It still did really well. Yeah. But yeah, he just found the film boring and monotonous. Christopher McQuarrie pulled all the character names from staff members of a law firm he worked at at the time of writing it. <laughs> That's a- pretty funny. Apparently, he came up with the majority of the outline on a break, on a lunch break in the office. I guess that's sometimes all it takes. And he even... The the Skokie, Illinois, was actually on a real whiteboard in his office. Skokie, Illinois. It's a clever guy right there. Clever guy. And uh, he also worked for a detective agency for some time, so that's how he wrote the criminals so accurately. Oh, that's Because awesome. he, he worked for a pr- private investigation firm. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That's a cool fact. All right. I mean, I think that wraps the usual suspects for me, man. I don't know about you. Oh, I got a couple of fun facts. You got a couple more? Yeah. All right. Let's get in there. Yeah. Let's get in there, man. <laughs> I thought you were... I didn't know you had so many facts, dude. <laughs> So, uh, Christopher McQuarrie actually has a cameo in the film. So, at the very end, when Chasma Palminteri's Kuan is standing outside the police station looking for Kaiser Soze, in the background, Christopher McQuarrie is dressed as a cop, and he's actually facing camera and laughing. And they're meant to, they're illustrating that he, the writer, is laughing at the audience for fooling them. That's really funny. Yeah. I gotta look that up again. <laughs> so, the five actors who played, Kev- who played Kaiser Soze were Gabriel Byrne. Kevin Spacey, John Ottman, Brian Singer, and the composer of the film as well. 
they all play different versions of Kaiser Soze. And the editor, you said, right? Yeah. You got him in there? Mm-hmm. So the executives at the Gramercy, the production company, didn't know how to market the film. And they didn't know how to market Kaiser Soze because it was an odd name for Americans. And they were worried that it would confuse people and people wouldn't really understand it and wouldn't really know what people were saying when they said the word Kaiser Soze. So they built the entire campaign of marking the film around the character's name. And so their main tagline for the, mail, for the film was, who is Kaiser Soze? And so that became talked about media, red carpets. People were asking the actors, who is Kaiser Soze? So that became their marketing strategy, the entire name and the mystery shrouding that character. Okay, now I'm done. All right, that's my fun done. facts. He's done. Thanks for all the the fun facts, and that wraps our episode on the Usual Suspects. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to become a patron today at Patreon.com/slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Leave those five star ratings and reviews on Spotify and Apple, and take care, everyone. Kaiser Soze. Kaiser Soze. Kaiser Soze. This episode was executive produced by our chosen one patrons: Cody Moen, Andrew Hagen, Becca Keen. Benjamin Cook, Calvin Murphy Griggs, Nicholas Martin, Darian Singleton, Tyler McFly, Andrew Hagen. Our chosen one patrons are our biggest supporters. Thank you so much. Raiders of the Lost podcast is a mirror image production. Sound mixing done by Jacob Kosler. Opening music by Chase Jackson. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button as well. Notifications for sure. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere you can listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out this other content we have on our YouTube channel.